Okay, so this is kind of the chapter on design principles, which is kind of mostly graphic design. And so we'll kind of start off talking about um, a rebranding that was done. So the Saks Fifth Avenue department store is pretty famous and they kind of had a challenge on their hands. Um, so the 21st century had dawned and Saks went into it with a, a strong brand and a good reputation at the time. Um, and they'd been building that since their first store had opened in 1924, but they did feel they needed to renew the brand, uh, maybe make it a little bit edgier. They wanted to attract younger shoppers without alienating the old ones. So that's kind of the challenge that was given to Michael Beirut, who is a graphic designer. Um, so he had this challenge and he actually worked for the graphic design firm Pentagram. And he was asked for suggestions on how to renovate the company's logo in a new but recognizable way somewhat traditional but still cutting edge to some degree. So in 2007, Michael Beirut created a new logo for Saks Fifth Avenue that quite literally, you know, shattered the previous elements of the design. So he actually took that familiar cursive script that had been their logo for many, many years and then sliced it into 64 square pieces, basically, and then rec recombined them randomly. The logo is still recognizable to older customers, but it still looks more modern and innovative. Um, you know, for some people, luckily, I mean, on these bags that he's created, he did put the, you know, traditional logo on the side to kind of work with the new image because you can't read this obviously because it's so sliced up. But the fact that he did this is also like something that you couldn't do with every brand, but since they had such a recognizable logo and brand, the fact that he sliced it up is not such a bad thing because it's such a recognizable brand that you could get away with that, with this particular brand of Saks Fifth Avenue. So, I mean, although it works in this instance, it wouldn't work in every instance. It would definitely work for like, you know, Coca-Cola um, because they have such a recognizable font. But if we did that with like Master Sports downtown, if they had a really, you know, if they had a logo, I don't know if they even do, but and you sliced it up and made it illegible, people wouldn't know what it was. So you can only do this with certain brands, but it is a new way of kind of recycling the old, but yet giving it that edge that, you know, they wanted to attract newer, younger customers. And they're an artisanal brand, so it makes sense for them to have a complicated artisanal, um, artisanal um, logo. So, Graphic design is, design is definitely the most frequent type of design we'll encounter in our daily lives. Um, they're usually unintended encounters. So like with fine art, like a painting, we would actually go to a gallery or museum to view it in person and actually seek it out. But with graphic design, we just end up seeing it without really trying to seek it out. So because of this, you know, graphic designers have the ability to attract, inform, persuade, delight, offend, repel and bore, you know, large numbers of people with their work. Um, the term graphic design refers to the process of working with words and pictures to enhance visual communication. So it's all about visual communication. And much of graphic design involves designing materials to be printed or either viewed on a screen. So printed materials would include books, magazines, posters, um, any kind of imagery for digital media, such as social media advertising, um, website advertisements. Some of it might be animated, some of it might be static. Such design ranges in scale and complexity from something like a postage stamp to trademarks to logos and then even some film, uh, video, personal, digital screens, websites, and even application design. So graphic design uses symbols, type, color, illustration, all together to create visual compositions meant to attract, inform, or persuade a given audience. So typically graphic designers are working together with advertisers to sell something or advertise an event or, um, you know, create a, a logo for a company, those kinds of things. So we'll talk about typography because that's a pretty big part of 
the puzzle when it comes to graphic design. It's basically the art, the art and technique of creating a composition using letter forms. It can also refer to the design of the letter forms themselves. So a complete set of letter forms, including all capitals for the letter, lower cases, numerals, so numbers, accent marks is called a typeface, which is also called a font. Graphic designers create designs that typically use images and printed words together in a composition. So just a few decades ago, people had to handwrite words or either use a typewriter. And nearly all typewriters had the same typeface. So font choices were very limited until the advent of the computer. So the computer really helped with the proliferation of typefaces and fonts. And it, the computer makes it really easy to select whatever font you're looking for. So computer programs and software are tools. So if the operator knows how to use these tools and has artistic sensibilities, they can create, create a lot of different art with those tools. So we did talk about this earlier um, in the semester, but the Chinese invented woodblock printing in the 11th century. And so thousands of typefaces have been created, especially since the advent of computer technology. So many European style typefaces are based on the capital letters carved in stone by early Romans. So that goes back to the Roman times. Roman letters are made with thick and thin strokes ending in serifs, which are short lines on the ends of the letters. Um, with pointed ends at an angle to the main stroke. And I can show you an example of a serif. And in typesetting, the term Roman is used to mean that it's not italic. Sans serifs are without serifs and they have a more modern look. So we'll kind of look at these here. So this is a serif font. Um, it has more of a traditional feel to it. You can see here's a serif here, and it has more thicks and thins included. So this is a thicker, and then this is really thin, this is really thin, um, this is thicker here. But these little hooks at the end of each line are called serifs. And then this is a sans serif. It's all usually one uniform thickness, and there's no hook at the end of you know, these letter forms. And so you can see here's a serif here. It actually circles all of these serif shapes. And then there's your sans serif. So um, that's kind of the difference between sans serif and serif. And sans serif just means without serif, because the serif is the name of these little shapes that get added to the letter form. So today, many type designers are redesigning and updating old fonts. So keeping in mind that they need to have readability and kind of contemporary looks and feels. So we can see the typographer's art in action with the Clearview Highway typeface designed by Donald Meeker. Um, and we'll take a look at this type of typeface that he actually kind of redesigned to kind of help with better readability on interstate highway signs that are used in the United States. So here it is, Clearview typeface. He did this in 2004, and it's still being used today as far as I know. So Donald Meekers and his associates designed this font because they're trying to improve the readability of those white on green signs that are on the interstate or freeway um, to kind of show what town or you know how many miles to the next place or even, you know, the name of streets. So they used the existing font that was traditionally used as a starting point, and then they just expanded the hollow spaces in the lowercase letters. So such as in the E, they just made this bigger, and the O, and the A, and any of those spaces, they tried to make those a little bit more apparent, just so that at a distance, you can really tell that that's either an E or an A or a D. Um, so that's one thing they did. They also meant, made a lot of other really subtle changes, such as adding a base to the lowercase i. Um, but, and there's a little bit of a serif on this L even, which kind of helps to identify that as an L and not an I. Because I mean, if from a distance, if you're going 70 miles an hour, 
from a distance that might end up looking to some people like an I, but adding that little bit of a curve and a serif on the end really helps to identify it as an L. So you can see, you know, that this kind of font is kind of a hybrid between serif and sans serif actually. And the reason that they did that was to actually help the eye pick out the let letter better and thus make them, you know, this font very much more readable, especially at high speeds and somewhat of a distance. You know, those small adjustments can really make, make a big difference to the human eye. So sans serif fonts have qualities that are helpful and so do serif fonts. So they kind of, like I said, combine sans serif and serif fonts together to create the ultimate readable typeface. So the Federal Highway Administration has tested this new font in all kinds of weather and lighting conditions um, with drivers of varying you know, visual acuity. So some of the drivers might be older, they might not have as good of eyes, but it actually tends to be, from their tests, they've gleaned that this font is definitely doing its job and is very readable. So they've actually been going and replacing the old signs across the United States, um, you know, periodically. And I think a lot of them have been replaced at this stage. So we can see some of the changes that they made here. Um, so the development of the Clearview Highway font from the previous federal highway font. So you can see this R, he changed that a little bit just to make it probably less condensed and easier to read somehow. I'm sure there's something behind that. And you can see the A, um, the space in the A from the original is way bigger, just to help, once again, the I recognize that A. So we'll talk about Heidi Cody, American Alphabet. She used um, 26 letters borrowed from various corporate logos. And we can actually see the Coca-Cola logo in the C which is actually, this is an old Coca-Cola logo, but we can see the um, L is actually the Lysol um, L. And then I think this is the M&M's M, and this is the Reese's R, and I think that's maybe Starburst's S. So she's kind of using letters from these logos um, to get viewers to kind of acknowledge how branded these various letter forms really are. Um, and that's kind of an interesting experiment. I mean, it's not the best example these days because a lot of these have been rebranded since 2000 when she put this together, but still there's a lot of them that I even still totally recognize. Um, I think this is the eye from the icy freeze, which would have been at the gas stations. Um, so there's some in here that I def I think that might be the Tide T from the Tide box. Of course, you know, since you guys have been, I think this is the Oreo O, but since you guys have been born, I'm sure a lot of you don't recognize any of these letter forms. You might still recognize the M and maybe the Lysol L, but, and this might be the E from the Ego box, but anyway, that might be a little bit more towards the older people. <laughs> um, so Jonathan Cuervo Cisnernos is another typographer who redesigns and updates old fonts. So he recently created the new font Febril based on black letter typefaces found on documents in colonial Latin America. So from very traditional colonial Latin America, he took those black letter typefaces and kind of updated them. He slanted the letters backward and kind of added these frilly details to the capitals. So we can take a look at these. And he actually created, so this is the, you know, historical examples of black letter typefaces that we can see here. These are handwritten documents by scribes that were probably done in like the 1500s. Um, or maybe, maybe sooner than that, maybe the 16 or 1700s potentially, but probably as far back as potentially the 1500s. But this is what Jonathan came up with, with Febril in 2014. And he did this digitally with the computer. And he is a, you know, type designer or typographer. And the word Fabril means nervous excitement or energy, which kind of makes sense with this font. I think the slanted form, the slanted line creates a lot more dynamicism. And it does kind of have a, a nervous energy to it because it has all of those frills and, and thicks and thins going on, a lot of variety in it that creates kind of a little bit of chaos and nervousness to it. Um, 
and like I said, it was created digitally with a computer 